Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. Hope everybody's doing well this morning. See some folks joining on. Good morning, Wayne. Glad to see you on here. Appreciate you watching and your comments. So we finished yesterday a series of... Oh, good morning, Gene Bailey. Glad to see you on here this morning. Looks like you missed most of Sally. Uh, that storm coming through the state of Alabama and the panhandle of Florida. Of course, I lived in Pensacola for about seven and a half years and preached there at the Leonard Street Church of Christ. And uh, I've actually been texting with a few of my friends down there, just checking on them. We need to keep that part of the country in our prayers. They got more stuff heading their way, too. All right, so anyway, we finished a series of six lessons on the AD 70 doctrine, so we're moving on. I received a question from a viewer about tithing and asked if I would address that particular topic. So that is what we are going to do today. This is a very common question, um, a very widely held belief. Good morning, Owsleys. Good morning, Roger. Glad you folks are on here today. This is a very common question about Christian finances. What should I give? I know uh, because I've dealt personally with friends of different religious convictions of different faiths who believe in tithing. Now, the tithing, the word tithe is mentioned many times in your, uh, specifically in the Pentateuch. I've got a few passages that I've got here. We're not going to look at all of these. We're going to mainly go to Deuteronomy chapter 14. Good morning, Charles. Um, anyway, I've, I've got, you know, friends that I've talked to about this over the years that believe in the practice of tithing. That is, that there is a 10% amount that one is to give of their finances to their church. Some religious organizations, some churches hold that to be doctrine, that you must give 10%. And a lot of them, I, say, I would say, just by being familiar with their teachings, they say 10%. Well, yes, that's the minimum you must give. That's your tithe. But then you can have a free will offering you know, above that 10%, whatever you feel like giving. But as a base, as a base amount, you are to give 10% of your income. Uh, <laughs> good morning, David. So let's talk about this for just a minute. I'm going to get my Bible out here, and I'm going to turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 14. Like I said, the Pentateuch mentions this subject quite often. The first time we read about it is, in fact, in Genesis chapter uh, 14, with Abraham giving a tenth of what he had to Melchizedek, who was priest and king of Jerusalem. And uh, that actually rolls on over into the New Testament in the book of Hebrews, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I just want to lay out some groundwork for this concept of tithing, where it comes from. So Deuteronomy 14, and I'm going to start reading here, as the screen says, in verse 22. And we'll just notice a few things here. Let me... Now, let me get to the right page. Deuteronomy 14, 22, beginning. Uh, you shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide. The tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil of the firstborn of your her uh, herds of your flocks that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. But if the journey is too long for you, that and this is the idea of the journey, the place being chosen, of course, would, would ultimately become Jerusalem. And so he's addressing that now. Well, if that journey is too far for you, um, so that you're not able to carry the tithe, you know, whatever you're going to bring, or if the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, where the Lord your God has blessed you, then you shall exchange it for money, take the money in your hand, and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses. Again, that would be Jerusalem. And you shall spend that money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen, for sheep, uh, for, <clears throat> excuse me, for wine or similar drink, for whatever your heart desires. You shall eat there before the Lord, uh, before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. You shall not forsake the Levite who is within your gates, uh, for he has no part in the inheritance with you. Of course, the Levites didn't in inherit a specific portion of land when the land was divided their inheritance was the 
responsibility of the priesthood, the temple and its instruments and all of that stuff. So part of this tithe was to uh, cover, you might say, or to take care of the Levitical tribe and their service to God. So uh, that's pretty obvious. Now, again, this was to be taken to Jerusalem. These are offerings to the Lord. Uh, got some more joining on here. Good morning, Lyle. Good morning, Connie. Hope you guys are doing well and glad you're on here today. But then the, the text goes on. So it's not just for an offering to the Lord. It's also to support the Levites and their work. But then also you get down to verses 28 and 29. It says, At the end of every third year you shall bring out, bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. And the Levite, because he has no portion nor inheritance with you, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are, uh, who are within your gates, may come and eat and be satisfied. <clears throat> that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand, which you do. So there are multiple purposes for, or there were multiple purposes for this tithe. Again, this tenth that was to be, again, given to the Lord and for the support of the Levites. You will notice there in verses 28 and 29, it was also to provide for the fatherless and the widows, you know, those who essentially couldn't provide for themselves every third year. Uh, that's, uh, that specific detail is given to us there. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, you have a set amount, but you will notice it's a tenth of the various things. Now, that comes out in the pages of the New Testament. I want to look at that real quick, too, this idea of not just a tenth part of their money, but also of their livestock and their grains and things like this. So Jesus actually hits on this topic uh, in his rather scathing rebuke of the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. And he touches on the various um, offerings that they would make and the the minute details that they would pay attention to. Matthew twenty three twenty three. What do you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? For you pay tithe, that is, you give a tenth of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. So they again they it was a tenth of a lot of things, not just of one thing. Again, grain offerings. Uh, Matthew 23 mentions these spices. Luke chapter 11 is the parallel account to that, by the way. Hey, Mom, glad to see you on here today. Hope you're doing well. Uh, but also of the, the firstborn of their flocks and herds. And again, all of that, when you look at the law of Moses, again, and I have several passages up here, Leviticus 27, Numbers 18, Deuteronomy chapters 12 and 14, and there are a lot of other passages, by the way. It was for various things... Um, in, in ultimately, obviously, in service to God, but also in the assistance of others, like the Levites, the fatherless, and the widows. One of the best things that you can do for your personal growth spiritually, for, the, for your growth in knowledge, is to have a, um, a concordance. I've had a few different concordances over the years. Uh, the best one, in my opinion, is, is called the Strong's exhaustive, exhaustive Concordance of the Bible. And, and you can look up all these words and find every place where those things or where these topics are mentioned in the Old and New Testament. You have in the back of those concordances a small Hebrew and Greek dictionary. It's not by any means extensive, but it's, it's helpful to learn the definition of these Old and New Testament words. So that's what a tithe is. Again, the first time we read about uh, of someone giving a tenth is when you go back to Genesis chapter 14 with Abraham and Melchizedek. And then you read about it throughout the law of Moses, <clears throat> what the Israelites were, were to be contributing. Now, that the incident with Abraham and Melchizedek also comes up in Hebrews chapter 7. So I'm going to turn over there real quick. And this is an important point to notice because, again, there are religious movements in the world that teach the necessity of a tithe, that is, of, a, of one tenth of one's income. Now, if they were to do it the way it's laid out actually in the law, it would be much more than just one tenth of their income. Um, it would be a tenth of everything they own, not just what they make weekly or biweekly or monthly. Uh, that's an important thing to remember. It's also important to note that when you get to the pages of the New Testament, the word tithe is only used here in Hebrews chapter 7. Now you have, um, you have it mentioned in Matthew chapter 23 in regard to the uh, scribes and Pharisees and what they gave um, in, in terms of their spices that they would cut out, cut out, weigh out. 
But then we have it mentioned here in Hebrews chapter 7 in regard to um, Melchizedek and Abraham. So Connie asks, let me get this question here real quick. Was the tithe done every third year to the last three years between the tithing years? If so, they must have known how to preserve the food. Well, so you're referring back there to Deuteronomy chapter 14, Connie, and the instructions were there in verse 28, at the end of every third year you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. So obviously there was some storage made. Another instance of storage was like Joseph and the uh, the famine that came upon Egypt. Store up for seven years, fat years for the seven lean years. Um, yeah, so they certainly did know how to preserve food. Uh, but it seems to me when you look there, and for some reason I've already closed my Bible to, <laughs> to Deuteronomy chapter 14, so let me get back to it. If I think I understand what you're asking, was the tithe done every third year to last the three years between the tithing years? That's what I see here. At the end of every third year, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. So I think the answer to what you're asking is yes. Uh, and food storage and preservation was, was obvious. And, and, you know, even... It's interesting, when you, when you look at the excavations of the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, uh, it's pretty interesting to note that they're still finding uh, viable seeds that were stored thousands of years ago. Um, Connie says the people were much smarter than they are given credit for. You know, I've, I've actually run into people, and this is kind of off topic, but who believe that most people back then, even in New Testament times, couldn't read or write. Um, we do give them much less credit than they actually deserve. Anyway, let's get back on topic. Hebrews chapter 7, we're not going to read all of this, but Hebrews 7 verses 2 through 9, what we have going on here, beginning really in Hebrews chapter 5, is the discussion of Jesus' priesthood as compared to both the Levitical priesthood, and you really get into that in Hebrews, um, I mean, it's here in Hebrews chapter 7, but also in Hebrews chapter 9. But comparing his priesthood to the Levitical priesthood, but also the priesthood of Melchizedek. And that's in Hebrews chapters specifically 5 and 7. Um, but the author here mentions uh, Abraham giving a tenth of all, verse 2. It's mentioned again in verse 4 that Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils to Melchizedek. Um, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 7. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Uh, here mortal men receive tithes. But there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. So this is not a discussion of all that uh, passage is talking about. All I'm pointing out is that <clears throat> the word tithe is used a couple of times in your New Testament. Matthew 23, Luke 11, and then Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 7 through 9. Now, let's talk about giving in the New Testament. Because, again, there are religious folk who believe that uh, our giving should be the tithe, um, that we should lay aside 10% of our, again, weekly, monthly, yearly, whatever, income to give. When you, when you get down to the specifics, the Israelites gave much more than one-tenth of their income. There was a lot more involved in that. Uh, so let's talk about giving in the New Testament. But in, in connection with this, Charles says... When you study the Sermon on the Mount, we are to do better than those under the law. And you know, Charles, that's right. And I would actually add in there Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6. We live under a better covenant that was established on better promises. Um, I would say if we're going to use the tithe principle, we ought to say that, sh that, that should be the lowest. That, sh that should be the very bare minimum that we would even think about offering to God. We can certainly do better than that. Anyway, let's talk about giving in the New Testament. We see this from the beginning of the church, where God's people would get together, and as Acts chapter 2 said, they would collect funds and distribute to every man as he had need. And then you have Acts 4 beginning in verse 32, and really through the end of that chapter talks about that. But you'll notice I have through chapter 5 and verse 11, Acts 5 in the first 11 verses is the record of Ananias and Sapphira. So the church knows that there are needy saints in Jerusalem. And what people were doing was they were selling their properties, they were taking up collections, 
and they were whatever they gathered up or whatever they wanted to give, they would lay at the apostles' feet and the apostles would make distribution. So this husband and wife team sell some stuff and they agree privately among themselves that they were going to hold back part of it. But when they presented it to the apostles, they presented it as if it was all that they had. And they lied. They weren't punished here for giving. They were punished because they lied about the amount that they were giving. Again, that's a whole other discussion. But from the beginning of the church, we see God's people gathering together to give. Now, let's look at some principles here. And I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I know typically one of the first passages that we'd like to run to is 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Now, we're going to get there. But I want to start here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. What is the principle of giving in the New Testament? First of all, there is no set minimum. All right, we need to understand that. But then you have this passage, for, uh, 2 Corinthians eight twelve. For if there first be a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. There it is. New Testament giving is a willing, uh, a free will offering. And it's based on what you have, not what you don't have. All right, then you get down to 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So I want to pay attention to a couple words here in verse 7. Notice this. So, to each, uh, so let each one give as he purposes, that is, plans out, uh, you know, sets aside ahead of time in his heart, not grudgingly. That word grudgingly in the Greek means not out of sorrow. In other words, it's the idea that you're going to give, but you regret that you have to do it. Just keep your money. You know, if you're going <laughs> to... If you're going to give to God and, and regret that you're giving him the amount that you are, it's worthless. See, this is a heart issue. And the fact of the matter is every aspect of our worship is a heart issue. It's not just a, a checklist that we go down and check off as we do each thing. If you're going to give grudgingly, keep your money. And then he says, or of necessity. That is, the Greek literally reads, out of distress. Your, your heart has to be right. So then he goes on to say, for God loves a cheerful giver. The Greek word for cheerful there is hilarious. It, it's out of a joyful heart that we give. It, there is no base minimum uh, set by the New Testament. What's the result of our giving? 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have abundance for every good work. God will take care of you. That's the teaching of 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. So you have the principle, a willing mind, and it's based on what you have, not what you don't have. What are the results? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter nine, chapters 8 and 9 are from a, a larger context. We'll notice that in a minute. Um, but notice what 2 Corinthians 9 verses 12 and 13 say on this subject. For the administration of this service, all right, the giving is referred to as a service, not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through the thanksgiving through many thanksgivings to God. So notice that the need of Christ, the needs of Christians are met, but God is being thanked. Two results there. While through the proof of this ministry they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ, and for your liberty. Notice this sharing with them, with Christians, and all. Now, there's a very, a very common belief among some uh, within specifically churches of Christ that you can only give money to Christians out of the treasury. Um, this verse ends that discussion. They're giving, again, notice 2 Corinthians 9 verse 13, uh, while, through, while through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them. With who? With them Christians. I mean, that's, that's the context here. And all. The church is never forbidden from giving to non-Christians. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto those who are of the household of faith. I think the principle is you take care of your own first, sure. But to say that the church collectively is forbidden by Scripture to give to all is just not, you won't find that in Scripture. So the results are 
needs are met, and God is glorified. Now let's notice a key here. So this, this kind of goes hand in hand with the principle that we looked at. But one of the things that's laid out as the key to good giving is 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 5. It says, And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord, and then to us by the will of God. Here's the thing. If I understand that everything I have is a gift from God, is a blessing from God, and, and that, you know, like the psalmist tells us, that the cattle upon a thousand hills are his, that everything is truly God's, number one, I'm going to dedicate myself to him first. Number two, I'm not going to have any problem giving. I'm not going to do it uh, grudgingly or out of necessity, Second Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6, because I know that God loves a cheerful giver. That's verse 7, not verse 6. That's the key to giving. And then again, we've already read 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 12, but what does it say? There must be a willing mind. And then it's accepted from what one has, not one what not what one doesn't have. So, you know, you look at every congregation, and there are people at different levels financially. You have peop, uh, people at different points in life. You have young couples who are starting out who don't have as much, who maybe have college debt, uh, you know, student loan debt, and maybe they've got young children and they don't have as much as a <clears throat> as an 80-year-old couple that's retired and they're sitting on a nest egg. Um, and so it's based on what you have, not on what you don't have. Uh, but it has to come from a willing heart, a willing mind. So let's talk about the pattern of giving, and that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And of course, what we typically do with this passage is say, well... You can only give on Sundays because 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. There's a thread that follows this giving. The giving of 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 is the giving of 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. It's also the giving from Acts chapter 11, and it's also the giving that's mentioned in Romans 15, 26. This is a continuous thread. And as you read 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, Paul says, you'll, you'll notice one of the things Paul says is, you need to finish what you started about a year ago. Well, guess what? 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 shows what they started about a year ago, a year previous to his writing 2 Corinthians. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, notice that, this collection for the saints, the needy saints in Jerusalem. As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. No, but you have to keep reading. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift. This giving that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, was a specific gift that was being sent to Jerusalem, verse 3. And then he says, but if it is fitting that I go, they also go with me. They're taking a large sum of money Paul says, we don't need just one person to take that. We need a couple of guys. You need to approve of who they are. And if you want me to go, I'll go too. And, you know, so Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. He said, we need to provide things honest in the sight of all men. It would be better to have a group of men handling this money than one man going by himself and traveling a large distance with a large sum of money. Just to avoid any sense, perhaps, of impropriety or dishonesty. Um... Again, this is, a, this is a, a, a connection. Romans 15, 1 Corinthians 16, uh, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. What we do see here is that when they came together, they gave. And I think part of the teaching here is that, you know, you do give on the first day of the week. But in addition to that, I think what ha what's happening here in 1 Corinthians 16 is a certain part of that collection was the laying aside that would be taken to Jerusalem. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 3. Do you have to give to the church on Sunday? Well, I think that's a good practice. What if a person is sick on Saturday and, and on Sunday? Can they bring a check to the church building on Monday? Well, of course they can. They laid it aside. Uh, it was dedicated to the Lord, you might say. So I, I think we need to be careful as to how we use 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we need to understand the larger context. So let me, I've mentioned this verse a couple of times, Romans 15 and verse, let me see here, verse 26. 
Uh, it says, for, the, for it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, uh, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister them in material things. And so this is that same collection. Corinth started that process upon Paul's instructions in 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 and 2, but a year later, it had kind of dropped off. And so you have then 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. In fact, let me turn over there real quick. And uh, I didn't put this up on the screen. 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 uh, talks about this. Well, I guess I should have put this up there, but anyway, he says, what you, what you determined to do a year ago, you need to go ahead and finish it. Whatever verse that was. <laughs> Here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 10. And in this I give advice. It is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you must also complete the doing of it. Um, that is, there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion of what you have. There you go. So, uh, tithing is not a part of New Testament Christianity. And again, I know some people teach that it is, but also some people teach the idea of um, 10% is, a, is, is an absolute requirement, but then you need to give above and beyond that. Well, again, you can't find that in the New Testament. Uh, would this only include monetary giving? Well, I think, I mean, obviously, Miss Jean, it certainly does involve it. And when you look at what's going on in 1 Corinthians 16 and, and Romans 15, 26 and 27, yes. Um, you know, there are certain financial obligations that churches must meet. Uh, you know, Paul, for instance, talks about 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the, the support of a, of a local, what we call a local preacher. He who preaches the gospel should live of the gospel. We think about helping the needy within a congregation, within your community, and certainly there, you know, you need money to do that, monetary sources to do that. Now, certainly that doesn't forbid us from helping in other ways, but I think primarily what we're dealing with here is money. Yeah, Deborah, they did lose track of time. And, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, how many of us have been in congregations where you'll start a work, you'll start a program, and within a few months or a year, it kind of, you know, it kind of fizzles out? Well, that's been happening since the first century. Uh, Connie says, we should not think that our giving is only in the collection plate. We can do things outside the church as well. Example, perhaps help on the support of a mission work that as a congregation cannot be done. Absolutely. Uh, certainly, none of that kind of stuff is forbidden. But there certainly is also the precedent for a, for a local congregation to have funds at hand for various needs within that congregation. We're not required to tithe. We're required to give a free will offering that comes from the heart, uh, that comes from a willing mind, again, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, that's not grudging or out of necessity because God loves a cheerful giver. And when you read between all the verses that we looked at in those two chapters, notice the language that Paul uses. It's a gift. It's a grace. It's a ministry. It leads to thanksgivings to God and uh, glorification of God. A lot of interesting things are connected with our giving. But don't mistake the Old Covenant tithing with a New Testament contribution because they're two different things. All right, guys, thank you for being on here today. I'm going to wrap it up. Appreciate your comments and questions as always. And as always, if you have anything further, even after the live stream is over, you will still be able to comment in the comment section here. If you have anybody that would like to access then con this content that does not do Facebook. You can send them, of course, over to our YouTube channel, Mammoth Spring Church of Christ on YouTube, and all of this content is uploaded there. So I appreciate y'all being here tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow, Thursday. We're going to talk about unidentified flying objects and extraterrestrials, UFOs and aliens, all right, for those of us who like smaller words, UFOs and aliens. This was actually a viewer question and a good one, I think. So we'll talk about that tomorrow at 11 Central. Hope you'll join in. And uh, until then, have a good day. And I will see you on the next video.